You know how God puts us through tests to try our faith? Have you ever thought to yourself, man, I've been through this test already. I've already been through this one. Why am I getting retested here? I've already done this. Lord, I did this already. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way? I've given up my problems. I've given up my sins. But God says, I will test you again, and your faith will be proven. Your faith in me will be proven, God says. David went from being, we're talking about David, right? David went from being a shepherd boy, alone with his sheep, trusted with only a little bit, just some sheep, and he showed himself faithful. His life shot into new times after his courageous victory over Goliath. Remember, he took out Goliath, this giant, bam. We saw him become a leader in Saul's army as well. He became a hero in the military as well. He won great victories for Israel. But then King Saul got jealous of David. He said, whoa, David is showing himself to be a great hero, and what am I? So he became jealous of David. He even tried to kill David several times. He tried to pit him to a wall with a spear. So David then went on the run. He said, if Saul's going to try to kill me, i got to go on the run. He starts living in a cave with a group of heroes. And eventually men gathered around David, 600 men. And David spared Saul's life in the cave when he could have killed him. But guess what? It's going to happen again. David will, will be tested again to see if he will remain faithful. He showed himself faithful once to God. Now he's going to get tested again later. Same test. Again. Boom. Have you ever felt tested again? To see who you really are. And are you still with God? He's still there. God wants to know, are you still with me? Are you still all in? Do you still love God first in your heart? And we think, we think when we go into that trial, we think, Lord, I did this already. <laughs> I, I've been through this one. Didn't I show you that I, I'm with you, God? And God says, but you got to show me again. I need to see it again. I need to see that you're all in. Are you all in today? We're talking about something that happened 3,000 years ago. But are you all in in 2023? For the Lord God Almighty. Are you? I want to be all in. I don't want to be halfway. Let's go all in. But maybe God's saying to us today, you've given me your struggles, that's good. You've given me your sins, that's good. You've forsaken your past ways. You, you've, you sent away Hagar with Ishmael. But now I want, I want Isaac. You've got to offer Isaac up now. You're saying, Lord, I already sent away Hagar with Ishmael. I sent away that, that cut you told me to, and I sent him away. And God's saying, you sent away that? Okay. Now I want what you love most. Is that easy? No. Says I want what you love, not just what you hate. <laughs> he, he wants our heart. That's the thing. God wants our heart. He wants to, yes, bless us. Give us hopes and dreams. Give us a mission for life. But, but Abraham, like when he gave up Hagar and Ishmael, he had to prove himself. to give up Isaac. And Abraham's thinking, but you told me Isaac would be my heir. He would be the one who would, you know, lead my line up. He says, I want you to give up Isaac. What you love. Would you be willing even to give him up for me? To give it all up for the Lord. All in. That's the challenge. David talking about David, he's already spared Saul's life once. King Saul was in the cave. David snuck up behind him. He could have taken him out right there. But he knew, this is the Lord's chosen one. He's the chosen king for now. I can't take, I can't take that away. I gotta let God do it. I can't be the avenger. I'm not the, I'm not the avenger, God is. So he says, good. God says, good. You did that once. 
How about, a, how, how about another, another time? Can you do that again? This is the second time. The, the first time is very famous. A lot of people know about Saul and David in the cave, yeah? The second time isn't as famous, but it's just as important if you ask me. It says in verses 1 through 4 here of uh, 1 Samuel 26, uh, now some men from Ziph came to Saul at Gibeah to tell him, David is hiding on the hills of Hekeliah, which overlooks Jeshimon. So he says, we know where David is. They, they, they go and they tell Saul. So Saul took 3,000 of Israel's elite troops and went to hunt him down in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul camped along the road beside the hill of Hekeliah near Jeshimon where David was hiding. When David learned that Saul had come after him into the wilderness, he sent out spies to verify the report of Saul's arrival. So he, so David knows Saul's coming. He's coming with 3,000 guys. He is coming. So he sends out spies to figure out where he's at. Where's he at? He's there. Okay, good. So many times now Saul changes his mind. Did you notice that? <laughs> the last time Saul said, we're, we're cool now. We're okay. We're good. About 10 seconds later, he says, actually, I'm going to kill David again. He just keeps changing his mind. He keeps going back and forth. He says, David's my buddy. I love David. He's my be best friend. Then he throws a spear at him, you know? <laughs> he says, okay. David spared me in the cave. I'm leaving. I'm going to let David be. A few, few days later, he says, let's go kill David. He's all over the place. He's all over. And that's our first point today. Stick to your decision. <laughs> if we, oftentimes when we look at the same, we want to be the opposite of what Saul did. First point, if you've chosen God's way, stick to that decision. Don't be double-minded, constantly floating between two opinions. I had a friend like that, a close friend. He could never make up his mind about anything. I tried to tell him something and he'd waver between two positions constantly. He could never come down on one side. I don't think, what is that about some people where they can't quite make a choice? Make your choice and stick to it. If you're in with God, good, stick to it. You don't have to waver back and forth. You make a faith <laughs> commitment. That's something in America we, we, we're not very good at, are we? Making a faith commitment. Can we make a commitment and stick to it? That'd be a good thing, right? That's hard, isn't it? To stick to a commitment even when it's tough. That's our first point today. Make a commitment, stick to it. You don't have to waver between two positions. Make your choice, stick to it. And if you don't, here's the thing. If you, if you do the opposite, where you're constantly wobbling, you'll start to wobble at everything. You'll start to wobble on people. You'll start to wobble in situations, on jobs. And I've known people like that. They can't, that they can't stick with anything very long. You know? And the first time there's an argument, the first time there's a difficulty, they quit and move on to the next thing. That's not a, a, a right way to live. It's not going to work. It doesn't, it's not functional. You are not going to get anywhere in life if you can't work through difficulties and stick to your guns. Okay? Next, in verses 5 through 8, David slipped over to Saul's camp one night to look around. David goes in the middle of the night to look around at Saul's camp. Saul and Abner, the commander of his army, were sleeping inside a ring formed by the slumbering warriors. So you've got a bunch of troops sleeping in a circle. And then you've got Saul and Abner in the middle, kind of protected by this sleeping circle of soldiers. Kind of interesting. Uh, and David, being uh, bold as a lion, he is bold as a lion. He is going in. He says, who will volunteer to go in there with me? <laughs> he says, I'm going in. I'm going into that circle of sleeping warriors. And Abijah says, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. <laughs> so David and Abijah went right into Saul's camp and found him asleep. With his spear stuck in the ground beside his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying asleep around him. And Abijah must have whispered to David, God has surely handed your enemy over to you at this moment. Let me pin him, so he says, let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't need to strike twice. Let me take Saul out again. You're in this situation. 
Once again, the life of Saul is in the hands of David. Fast asleep. They are sleepy, deep sleep. What will we do? Second point today. God will put you in a situation where you have a difficult choice to make. Yeah, you ever notice that? Man, there's been so many hard choices in my life where I had a hard choice to make. He, he, listen, that's not by accident. It's not by accident. There are hard choices to make in life. And even if you make a commitment, like I made a commitment to stay sober 10 plus years ago, God is gonna test you again and again. Are you gonna hold to that commitment? And it's tough, you, 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 you're in situations and, and you see it in recovery as well. They are trying to stay sober and then a family member dies. And then something else happens. And then something just crazy, they lose their job. They, lose, they And it's hard. But it's not by accident a lot of the time. Sometimes it's the enemy, sure, Satan. But sometimes it's God putting you in that situation to test your heart. Yeah, you'll be in that situation. Many things are not easy for a Christian. God tests and refines our hearts, it's true. That's what I want you to see today. And God is looking at the heart again and again. And we, here's the thing, we, we can adjust the course of our heart toward good or evil by our choices to a certain extent. Our choices determine the course of our heart, you could say. The status of our heart is determined in many ways by our choices. So we can poison our heart with bad choices or we can bless our heart with good choices. But only God can change the heart completely, make it hard to soften. Last time, David had stumbled upon Saul by accident in the cave. This time, David goes to Saul and finds him. He can kill him right there, but the Holy Spirit is moving in David's heart. It says in verses 9 through 12, No, David said, don't kill him. For what can, who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? Surely the Lord will strike Saul down someday, or he will die of old age or, or in battle. The Lord forbid that I should kill the one he has anointed. But take his spear and the jug of water beside his head, and then let's get out of here. So David took the spear and jug of water that were near Saul's head. Then he and Abijah got away without anyone seeing them or even waking up because the Lord had put Saul's men into a deep sleep. You know, God has saved me from many temptations over the years. They simply don't come. Like a lot of them in the wrong moment would destroy me. <laughs> the Lord has saved me. He, he blocks them from even showing up, which is good. Praise the Lord. But... Even though he's protected me, many a times it does come. Many times it does come. And yes, to David, it helps him. But also, I think God does this just to allow that moment to play out. What choice will you make? David's heart is again proven to be a godly heart, a man after God's own heart. Should I try to harm the one who is against me? No, certainly not. Should I speak up boldly about the truth? Yes, I certainly should. But who am I to harm the Lord's anointed one? God has placed Saul in that position at that time. And eventually Saul would fall, but David would again let God do that. It's not his choice to make. That's our third point today. Let God orchestrate the events in your life. Don't take control. Let God be in control of your life. That's tough. We all want to be in control. We want to try to manipulate events. But here's the thing. The world's too big. The universe is too big. We can't control it. We don't have control over much of anything, do we? Not really. Maybe a little bit. But what would happen if we let God control our lives? What, what, what might be better than trying to force things to go our way? What if we prayed and said, and said God, how your will be done? Not mine. I don't know what to do. I don't know what job I should work, what car I should get, what, you know, where I should live. I don't know these things. Who does? I remember being terrified by the, by the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. That's a big question. What do you even say to that? <laughs> what do you want to be? I don't know. Nothing. <laughs> Everything? Who knows? Well, I, I wish someone had told me, ask God what you should be. <laughs> and he'll tell you. <laughs> That's that simple. Like, is that not logical? <laughs> yeah. Let go of control. Let go and let God. Stop trying to manipulate events. Surrender to God. Say, God, you do it. 
I don't know what to do. Let's see what happens next, verses 13 through 20. It says, David climbed the hill opposite the camp until he was at a safe distance. He climbs up this hill. Then he shouted down to the soldiers and to Abner, son of Ner, Wake up, Abner. And Abner was like, oh, what? Who is it, Abner demanded. And David says, well, Abner, you're a great man, aren't you? Where in all Israel is there anyone as mighty? So why haven't you guarded your master, the king, when someone came to kill him? This isn't good at all. I swear by the Lord that you and your men deserve to die because you failed to protect your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around. Where are the king's spear and the jug of water that were beside his head? Saul recognized David's voice. So Saul's awake now. He calls it, is that you, my son David? Point number four. I think this is a good show the proof. Show the evidence. He doesn't leave empty-handed. He takes his spear and his jug of water. Show the evidence. If you, if, if you did the right thing, make, make sure you got a little bit of proof that, that you did what you did. Okay? Not to glorify yourself, but simply for evidence for the situation. David takes Saul's spear and water jug, disarms him, but doesn't harm him. And David replied, yes, you, y yes, Lord the king, why are you chasing me? Why are you chasing me? What have I done? What is my crime? But now, let my lord the king listen to his servant. If the lord has stirred you up against me, then let him accept my offering. But if this is simply a human scheme, then may those involved be cursed by the lord. For they have driven me from my home, so I can no longer live among the lord's people. And they have said, go worship pagan gods. Must I die on foreign soil, far from the presence of the lord? Why has the king of Israel come out to search for a single fleet? Why does he hunt me down like a partridge on the mountains? He says, why are you hunting a flea? He's so humble. Man, in that situation, you think I'm going to call myself a flea? Maybe I should, though, you know? David does. He says, why are you hunting for a flea? David calls out Saul, though, and it's nonsense. He says, you're not doing right. I'm just a flea, but you're not doing right. Point number five. We should do the same. I want you to listen to this one. For each other in a loving way. David rebukes Saul. We should do the same for each other today. We should correct each other in love. Gently, with love, in the right spirit, but do be bold in correcting each other. We need someone to speak truth into our lives when we're wrong. Amen? Amen, we do. I do. And we must be willing to listen to that voice, too. Listen to that voice. Let me repeat that. We must be willing to listen to that voice. And our, the Proverbs say our attitude towards someone that's rebuking us should be to be impressed. Proverbs says a wise man is impressed by rebuke. So I've tried to train myself. If someone rebukes me and I can tell they, they, they have a bit of a point, I think, wow. That took guts. Not bad, pal. You know? Nice one. <laughs> I hope that's your attitude as well. And the wrong attitude is to get mad and storm out. That's the dumbest way you can deal with it. Get mad and storm out. That, that means you got an anger issue. Your, your attitude should be impressed. I'm impressed. I'm impressed by that rebuke. Thank you. I'll have another. No, it's okay. Just the one is fine. Uh, uh, th thank you. I'm going to think about that. Don't get angry. Don't storm out. Don't be, a, don't be a foolish attitude. Instead, listen and realize the love it took for them to do that. Someone who really loves you will rebuke you because they love you. If they love the relationship more, they're not going to rebuke you. And that's really selfish, really. Say so someone I know has a bad drinking problem, but I like the relationship, so I'm not going to bring it up at all. Is that loving? To not bring it up and say, hey, I love you, you're my friend, you got a drinking problem, how can I help? Uh, selfish to not bring it up, in fact. Selfish. But you're risking the relationship when you bring it up, aren't you? You are, you are, yeah. And you're doing it for the love of them. Wow. David calls out Saul. But he's also so humble that he says, I'm a flea. But you're doing wrong. Saul's response is this, verse 21. I have sinned. 
come back home. I wouldn't do that. My son, and I will no longer try to harm you, for you valued my life today. I have been a fool and very, very wrong. Here's the thing. Point number six, Saul saying, come on home. I, I sinned. Come back. Here's the thing, though. Point six, just because he made things right doesn't mean he didn't, you need to move back in. <laughs> Don't move back in. That's all. He is... He's wishy-washy, so you, you move back in and he might throw another spear at you in a week when he changes his mind again. Just because you've corrected someone, an ex-lover or a friend, doesn't mean you need to renew the friendship or get back together. David understands that. Saul probably isn't going to change, but we're cleaning up our side of the street. But David has wisdom. He knows Saul will probably uh, change his mind again and try to kill him. The whole incident ends like this, verses 22 through 25. Here is your spear, O king, David replied. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord gives his own reward for doing good and for being loyal. And I refuse to kill you even when the Lord placed you in my power, for you are the Lord's anointed one. Now may the Lord value my life even, even as I have valued yours today. May he rescue me from all my troubles. And Saul said to David, blessings on you, my son David. You will do many heroic deeds and you will surely succeed. Then David went away and Saul returned home. Saul again makes nice with David. David knows it's probably not going to last too long. But David is ultimately talking to God in this conversation, if you look at it closely. He says, may the Lord rescue me from my troubles. And I think that's biblical to say that when we honor God with our choices, when we serve him, and when we care for the needs of the poor, it says in Proverbs, he then helps us when we are in trouble. It's not a give and take sort of thing. I don't want to say it's like, it's like an exchange. It's not. Um, we are under grace, but wise choices, submission to God is going to lead to God protecting us in times of trouble. Similarly, if we don't really follow God and then get into trouble, then ask God, please get me out of this mess and, 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 and I won't do it again. It's not likely that God will answer that prayer. Uh, though, though maybe he will, you know, uh, that may be the start of a new journey there. Possibly. It's possible. So in conclusion today, let's review our main points. And the key is what I always say. How do I put this into practice? How do I take this from hearing it to putting it in my life and saying, how am I going to live differently now? That's the hard part. Anyone can listen to a sermon in one ear, out the other. But how do I apply it to my life? How do I live this? lifestyle. So here are the points. Number one, stick to your decision to serve God. Stick to your, stick to your guns. Keep your commitment in faith to God no matter what. Point number two, God will sometimes lead you toward difficult choices to test you. Make the right choice again, and that's going to be a victory. Stick to your guns. God will test you. Three, let God control your life. Let go and let God, right? Let go of your manipulations and let God run your life. Number four, show the evidence. Show the evidence that you did right. Make sure you show your work sometimes. Keep a, keep a record there. Not, not to show how great you are, but simply to show the other person, I, I did not wrong you here, okay? Here's what happened, I didn't wrong you. Number five, correct each other with loving truth. Correction, rebuking each other is a good thing. Number six, don't move back into a bad situation. Set boundaries after forgiveness. And number seven, if we honor God, he protects us. If we honor God, he will protect us when we cry out for help in our time of need. Okay? Those are our seven points. How do we apply them? That's the challenge. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this example from David's life. We are praying, God, that you would bring these things to mind and heart in, in, our, in our hard times. When we're in a crisis or a situation that needs wisdom, God, please bring these things to mind so we can live right. I pray that for every person here, God, in Jesus' name, amen.